Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. We're going to begin today the Gospel of John. And I'm going to begin in verse 19. I've dealt with 1 through 18 previously. That's such an exciting passage. I get lit up just reading it. But today we're going to deal with a passage that we normally don't deal with as much. And that's verse 19 through 51, which I think really has as tremendous as a theological statement as verses 1 through 18. But we get so overpowered with that introduction, we very seldom read through it and see uh, what John is doing. Let's look at verse 19. Now, this is the testimony which John gave. The Gospel of John, written much later than the other Gospels, assumes the baptism of Jesus. He does not go into it, does not describe it. But he does major on the testimony of John the Baptist, and that's what's so unique about this passage. For John is going to make some Christological statements that are phenomenal and wonderful. He's also going to deal with two heresies that had developed in the early church and John, writing toward the close of the first century, wanted to target both of these problem groups. One was a heresy that developed around the person of John the Baptist and the other was a heresy that developed over the controversy around the humanity and deity of Jesus Christ and we'll deal with those. Now it says... The Jews, you see it there in verse 19? In John, the, the term the Jews often refers to the leadership in Jerusalem that's hostile to the gospel. Now, it's not the racial sense we usually use it because many folks trust the Lord in John. But usually it's those religious leaders, be them Sadducees or Pharisees, uh, scribes or priests that seem to reject or attack or turn away from the good news. Notice here it's priests and Levites. Now this is the only place in all the Gospel of John that Levites are used, the term. They, they were a, uh, all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. The priests that weren't, I mean the Levites that weren't priests took care of the temple, sang in the temple choir, and made up the temple police. So I think probably it was the priest and the temple police that came to ask Jesus. Now, down in verse uh, 24, the Pharisees are going to uh, uh, come and confront Jesus. So I think probably the priests and, and the Levites probably refers to the Sadducees because most of them would be in that group. Came from Jerusalem, that would be the headquarters. Um, who are you, they asked. Now, here's the problem. John the Baptist out there by Jericho on the other side of the Jordan and large numbers of people are coming to him. One gospel even says most of Jerusalem had turned out to hear him. He was baptizing large numbers of people and the religious leaders wanted to know a couple of things about him. They wanted to know where his credentials were. They wanted to know who he claimed to be. And so they send this deputation out. And look at verse 20. John got a little nervous. It's almost a uh, uh, way of talking about how tongue-tied he got. He says... He frankly admitted, the word is confessed. He did not try to deny it. Yes, he frankly admitted. Three repetition forms of how assertive he was in the answer to their questions. And they are asked him three questions. We see all three down there in verse 25. They're going to say, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Now, all three of these were personages that were expected from the Old Testament scriptures. Of course, the first one, Messiah is the promised one of God. The word Christ is the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word Messiah, which means the anointed one. Now, in the Old Testament, people were anointed. Prophets, priests, and kings is where John Calvin got his uh, Christology form from. And so, it was anointed to show the special call and the special equipping of God for a task. And John says, no, I'm not the Messiah. They said, are you Elijah? Now, what's that all about? Well, in the book of Malachi, also known as Malachi, depending on how you pronounce it. <laughs> uh, chapter 4, verse 5, uh, Elijah is going to come before the Messiah and prepare the way. We see the way he's going to prepare the way in chapter 3, verse 1. So people were expecting a reincarnation of Elijah. Now, when they ask him here, are you Elijah? And he says, no, I'm not. 
That's kind of strange because Jesus, in Matthew eleven fourteen, Matthew seventeen twelve, says that John the Baptist fulfilled the ministry of Elijah in preparing the way for the Messiah. I think it's not really a contradiction. John's saying, I am not Elijah reincarnated. Jesus is saying, John the Baptist fulfilled the preparatory ministry of Elijah. And so it's two different ways of looking at the same thing. And the last one here we have in verse 21, are you the prophet? Now, back in Deuteronomy 18:15, Moses said, one like unto me will come after me, follow ye him. And he is called the prophet. Now, we learn from the Essene community, which John may have been involved with, the Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, same group that they expected three different messianic or eschatological people to come. And so maybe this is why there were three persons mentioned here, the Messiah, Elijah, and the prophet. We're just not sure. But John says, I'm not any of those. And so this group needed to say something about who he is. So they said, well, who are you then? If you're not ABC, who are you? And so John tells his understanding of his own ministry. And he gets it from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Or you might want to see Malachi 3, 1, where the same ideal is presented. He said, I am a voice crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, or make straight the road of the Lord. It's translated many ways. Now, this was the idea. This was used in the concept of a royal visit from a king. And people would go ahead of that king, and they would clean up all the trash and paint things up and get the road ready. And it came to be used in that sense of a royal visit. One of the New Testament terms for the second coming Perusia, or the coming of the Lord, is the same idea of a preparation for a royal visit. I think it's, it's really unusual to see that John says, I'm a voice. Jesus says, I am the Word. Well, that's quite a difference. John was really taking a back seat and pointing everyone to the Messiah. I think that's very, very important that we see that. Now, notice it mentions here, um, now the messengers belonging to the party of the Pharisees ask him, then why are you baptizing if you are not the Messiah, Elijah, or the prophet? Here was their a answer. They were saying, okay, you, you don't claim to be anybody that's uh, prophesied in the Bible. Where do you get your authority for baptizing all these people? Who do you think you are anyway? How do you get off doing this? Now, John is going to answer them in rather a strange way. I really think that baptizing was, it was known in rabbinical Judaism, but only for proselytes. Never for Jews. A proselyte was someone who had been circumcised and baptized themselves in front of witnesses. But John was saying Jews need to be baptized for repentance and to prepare for the Messiah. And they were saying, why do you do this? Well, there are several Old Testament passages that I think talk about sprinkling clean, which may have uh, messianic implications for what John is doing. Let me give those to you real quick. Isaiah 52:15. Ezekiel 36, 25, and Zechariah 13, 1. John answers him by saying, I'm only baptizing in water, but one's coming after me who's going to baptize in the Holy Spirit. Now, you might want to see Matthew 3, 11, where it talks about the purpose of this. Baptism was for repentance and to receive the Holy Spirit. And that's the way John talks about it. Now, he says, I'm not even worthy to untie his leather thongs. Now, the rabbis taught that a, a disciple of a rabbi should do everything for the rabbi that a slave would do for a master except untie his sandals. So what John is doing is picking a cultural illusion to show his deep humility in his understanding of who the Messiah is. Now, you notice the word Bethany there. That is not Bethany near Jerusalem. That is another Bethany that's across the Jordan River, uh, probably around Jericho, the northern part of the Dead Sea, where John baptized. Now, some of you have King James. You have a different term. And that got into the text through Origen, who said he visited this area and couldn't find a Bethany, but found a name like this and stuck it in. It is totally inappropriate. The name in all the manuscripts is Bethany, except those ones that have been influenced by Origen. Uh, notice verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Look, he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Here's one of the first Christological statements that John makes. He's going to make several of them. He calls Jesus the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. There's been a lot of discussion about exactly what Old Testament metaphor or illusion we're drawing from. 
It's obvious when it says takes away the sin of the world that the Lamb of God is in a sacrificial sense. Jesus, the innocent one, is going to die on behalf of the guilty ones. Now, some think it refers to the Passover. Apparently, that was very close because it's mentioned in chapter 2. Some think it refers to the ram in Genesis 22 caught in the thicket when Abraham offered Isaac. And I personally believe that it refers to Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement, especially the, the idea of the scapegoat. The reason I get that from, when it says, we'll take away the sin, the Greek word there means to lift up and bear away. And if you're familiar with the uh, ritual on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would lay his hand on two goats. They would cast lots. One goat was for Aziel, a red scarf or string was tied around his neck, and he was driven into the wilderness, sometimes over a precipice to die, as a sin of something dying to take away sin. The other, the other lamb was sacrificed on the altar. I think there is the symbolism that we have in one of these, in which I'm not really sure. But in it beautifully it takes away the world's sin, not sins, Jesus didn't deal so much with sins as he dealt with the whole sin problem. Now, the plural is taken care of in the singular. Jesus came, and it wasn't for the Jews' sin, it was for the world's sin, the universal substitutionary atonement of Christ. Now, another thing that John's going to say is where he says, because he existed before me. This is the theological affirmation that Jesus is preexistent. Now, back in John chapter 1, verses 3 and 10... John asserts that Jesus uh, created the world. Wow. Wow. But that's not the only place. There are several other places. If you look in your outline, I think especially uh, chapter 8, verses 57 and 58, and 17, 5, the pre-existence of Jesus is emphasized. He has always been God. He has always been with God. And that's the emphasis we want to make. Now, um, and here's the purpose of why John came. It's twofold. I did not know him myself, but I, but I came baptizing in water that he might be made known to Israel. Two reasons, I think, of John's preaching. Number one, he preached to prepare the way for the Lord, for people to repent and get right with God. And he, and he preached to show Israel who the Messiah was. And I think we see that there. And John gave this testimony. I saw perfect tents perfect middle, I myself saw the Spirit coming down from heaven like a dove. It remained on him. Now look at verse 33. He repeats the same thing and the concept of remained on him again. Remained as heiress tense once and for all. What is he saying? John is saying, I'm telling you, this is John the Baptist, I'm telling you what I saw with my own eyes. And what I saw has so impacted me that I've never got over it. Now this is against the Gnostic heresy. The whole book of 1 John, especially chapter 1, is exactly in the same vein, where John the Apostle says, I'm telling you what I saw. I'm telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I witnessed. That's what John the Baptist is doing. What they're saying is, Jesus is really a man, and Jesus is really God. For the Gnostics denied, they wouldn't deny that he was the Christ, spiritual God, but they could not believe he was a man. John the Baptist is saying, I was there, I touched him, I saw it, and I'm testifying to you that he was flesh and bones as well as deity. And that's, that's the emphasis here. Now, notice where it says, I did not know him myself. Now, I personally believe he's not saying that he didn't know Jesus because they're, I think they're cousins. I think they probably spent some time as children together. I think what he's saying is, I did not know that my cousin, Jesus from Nazareth, was God's Messiah until he came to me to be baptized and I saw the dove coming down and God the Father told me when I saw that happen that that was the Messiah. Now, I, that's what he's saying. Now, the idea about the Holy Spirit coming down, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. I personally believe you take all these passages where John the Baptist refers to Jesus and you combine that with 1 Corinthians 12, 13, you'll come to understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit or in, with, and by the Holy Spirit is really the incorporation of the believer into the body of Christ, into the church. It's initiating salvation, if you please. Now, what about the idea of a dove? Why a dove? Well... In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says the Spirit brooded over the waters. Now, the word brooded is a bird term. <laughs> it's a hovering, a bird hovering. 
Maybe the idea of a dove hovering comes from that. Some think it comes from the idea of Noah uh, sending out the dove, that the, the, the promise of uh, God never destroying the earth again, the flood was over. I really think the dove was probably a symbol of the nation of Israel, but it's not a real strong symbol when we have a hard time pinning down, and that's probably what it is here. Now, notice it says, One who sent me to baptize in water said to me, Here is God speaking to John as an Old Testament prophet. Um, and there's the I did see, perfect tense. My testimony is, perfect tense. He is uh, the Son of God. And there's the emphasis of deity, a very strong, strong term. Um, verse 35. The next day John was standing with two of his disciples. Now, they're not really named here, both of them. Andrew and John the Apostle is who I think we're talking about. And Jesus walked by and John said to them, Look, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples left John and went and followed Jesus. And then they had a strange little uh, uh, dialogue in verse 38. They came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. So they went and saw, and he was staying, and they spent the rest of the day with him. Now, what's all that about? Well, <clears throat> there was a set relationship between a teacher and a disciple. And it seems to me that Jesus and these, these two men are initiating that unique relationship where they are going to come and be the disciples of Jesus. They didn't want just to ask him a few passing questions on the road. They wanted to come and stay with him and spend some time with him and let him teach them. Now, there is a, quite a difference between this call of the disciples and Mark 1, about 16 and following. And some of us said, how can they be so different? Mark 1 is the Sea of Galilee. Here we're in a different area. <clears throat> this has been the theory, and I, I'm not sure I buy it, but I think it's the best we got. John seems to be the call or the coming of them to Jesus as followers or disciples. Mark 1 seems to be the call of them as the unique 12 apostles. If we didn't have this first chapter of John, we would never know of Jesus' earlier ministry in the area of Perea because the synoptics don't really record that. They just start off with his ministry in Galilee. And so I think that's probably the relationship here. Now notice where it says, the rest of the day. Now this has been much discussion about this last little phrase in verse 39. It was about the four in the afternoon. Now some of you have different translations. Any of you have ten in the morning? Ten in the morning, any translation here? What translation is that, Mike? NAS? Okay. I really think that what we have is a debate over if we're in Roman time or if we're in Jewish time. And I have given you on your outline an uh, extensive thing on that, and I hope you'll look at that and compare those texts. Compare John 19.14 with Mark 15.25, and then look at John 11.9. For I really think John flip-flops. I think he uses both of them, and it's hard to know exactly. It's either 4 o'clock in the afternoon or 10 in the morning, and we can't be dogmatic about which it is. I get a real tickle when I look at the early church. The uh, method of interpreting the Bible known as allegory can almost prove anything from the Bible. Augustine said the tenth hour refers to the Ten Commandments. Other uh, early church allegorical expositors said that ten is just the number of completion. No, ten is just the time. It's just the time. That's all it is. We can't read all that we want to. We have to the text speak for itself. And it's just a time of day, nothing more. Now, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed. He first found, I mean, it's either he first went or he's the first one to bring his brother, in which it is that the manuscripts are divided where we can't really say, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. And he took him to Jesus. What a beautiful picture. And Jesus looked over him. Jesus gazed intently at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. From now on, you shall be Cephas, which means Peter or rock. Now, this name is very important because in Matthew 16, 17, 18, 19, this whole thing about the church being built on Peter is talked about. Now, Cephas is the Aramaic term for rock. But when Cephas comes into Greek, it comes in as Petros. Now, Petros is masculine, and it means a large, detached rock. But in Matthew 16, Jesus says, You are Petros, and upon this Petra, feminine, which usually used for a large, massive layer of rock in the earth, 
bedrock. What Jesus was saying is not that Peter himself would be the foundation of the church, but either Peter's profession or the disciples' profession or faith itself, because that, that uh, masculine Petros cannot relate to the feminine Petra in that grammar. And everybody who would know Greek in that day would recognize Jesus was making a play on these words. Now, Peter was anything but a rock for most of his life. Uh, the, the cock crowing is a good example of Peter the rock as uh, liquid rock. But boy, I want to tell you, after the resurrection, he became that for the early church. You know, I love Peter. And just because we're in a controversy over how to interpret Matthew uh, 16, don't you ever, don't you ever, ever doubt the leadership of the Apostle Peter in the early church. Friends, he was a pillar. He's my kind of guy. He's the kind of guy, if you don't know what to say, stick both feet in your mouth, you know. <clears throat> now, um, let's see. Verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And here we have where the other Gospels pick up. It's so important to me that Jesus had a ministry in Galilee. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, a very unusual prediction about a light shining in the area around Galilee, the two tribal allocations, Zebulun and Naphtali, that are there. And uh, it's so unusual for any kind of prophetic person to come out of Galilee. And here we have 750 years before the fact, the major area of Jesus' ministry that was highly unusual was predicted when it talks about a great light will shine from this area. And you ought to see Isaiah 9-1 for that predictive prophecy. Now we have uh, Nathaniel mentioned here. Uh, by the way, he's called Bartholomew in the synoptics. He's never called uh, Nathaniel. And we're also going to have uh, Philip. The next day he decided to leave for Galilee, so he sought Philip and said to him, Follow me. It's a present imperative, very strong command. Uh, now, Philip was from Bethsaida, which means house of fishing, uh, the town of Andrew and Peter. And Philip sought out Nathaniel, Bartholomew. It, the Hebrew Nathaniel means God has given, and said to him, We found the one about whom Moses wrote in the law. That would be the prophet, Deuteronomy 18.15. And the one whom the prophets wrote. Now, that's the second division of the Hebrew canon, and I think he's probably referring to something like Isaiah 53 or one of those predictions in the prophets. Jesus, the son of Joseph, who comes from Nazareth. Now, Nathanael knew his Old Testament. So did Philip. And Nathanael said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> he knew that the Messiah was supposed to come from Bethlehem. And he wasn't expecting the Messiah to be the son of Joseph from Nazareth. He asked the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's the wrong place. How can this guy be the Messiah? And so, but he's willing to come and look for himself. And so Philip says, come and see. The present middle imperative, you yourself come and see. Jesus said to Nathanael, coming toward him, He is a genuine Israelite with no deceit in him. Now what this means is, here is a man of the nation of Israel that has no hidden motives. And it's a strange little term. You might want to see Psalms 32.2 where that's used. Okay? And Jesus says, um, <clears throat> How do you know me? Jesus answered, while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you, I saw you. And Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Now, we don't know what Nathanael was doing under that fig tree. Some think Jesus is going to refer to an Old Testament passage, and maybe he was reading that part of the Old Testament. Some think he was out there praying. Uh, whatever he was doing under that fig tree, Jesus saw him and told this man exactly where he was and alluded that he knew what he was doing beforehand. Here is the supernatural nature of Jesus breaking forth in Nathaniel's life, and Nathaniel recognized it and made a tremendous affirmation. Now, <clears throat> he calls him the Son of God and the King of Israel. I'm sure that these two titles were caught up in Nathaniel's understanding of what the Messiah was going to be. And the, the, all the apostles seemed to misunderstand. They did not see the suffering servant of Isaiah. They saw the conquering king setting Israel back in the place of prominence. And I'm sure Nathaniel was saying more than he really knew. Because, and this will surprise you, I do not believe the Jews expected the Messiah to be God incarnate. Even those marvelous names in the, Isaiah... All those Hebrew names have God involved in tremendous ways. They were not expecting God incarnate. It was only when Jesus began to claim that that they began to see the tremendous fulfillments 
in the Old Testament. Now, uh, Jesus answered him, Do you uh, believe in me uh, because I told you that I saw you on the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. And he said to him, I most solemnly say... <clears throat> John is the one that uses the term... Do any of you have amen, amen, King James? Verily, verily, I most solemnly say. The word amen is a Hebrew word, not a Greek word. It's transliterated into Greek. It's transliterated into English. It is the original Hebrew word for faith. It means to be firm or to be strong or to be stable. But as the word was used, it came to mean, I affirm what you say. I agree with what you say. There's no example anywhere in Greek literature of anyone else starting a sentence with amen, amen. Whenever Jesus says that, he's saying, listen up, i got something important to say. And that's what he's saying right here. You will see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down upon the Son of Man. And this is Genesis 28, 10 and following, where Jacob at Bethel has a dream and he sees the ladder and the angels coming up and down from heaven. Now, many think that what Nathaniel was reading is this passage in Genesis. That's why Jesus alludes to it. Because Jesus changes the place from Bethel to the angels coming, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, that is Jesus' title for himself. Nobody else uses that except one time outside the mouth of Jesus. The Son of Man, I think, comes from two sources in the Old Testament that really fits this Christological passage. Number one, it comes from the book of Ezekiel and many other places where God would say to the prophet, Stand on your feet, Son of Man, I will speak to you. He's just saying, Man, get up. It just means human being. But in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, One like unto the Son of Man, a human being, comes before the Ancient of Days riding on the clouds of heaven. Nobody rides on the clouds of heaven but God. The clouds of heaven are the transportation of deity. So in Daniel 7.13, we have a human and divine figure coming before God and the kingdom, the eternal kingdom, is given to him. So here we have a title that is not used by rabbinical Judaism, not used by inner uh, testamental authors. Jesus used it for himself, I think, because, number one, it wasn't corrupted by misuse in rabbinical Judaism. Two, it stood for the major theological emphasis that Jesus wants to make about himself, that he is fully human and that he is fully divine, and this term does both of that. Now, the beautiful thing about this section is that we have as strong of a Christological statement on the lips of John the Baptist as we have anywhere in the Gospels. The Son of God, pre-existent, the Lamb of God. Well, those are strong affirmations. And the King of Israel, I hope you know him. I hope you know him.